Longhorns traveling up to Stillwater this weekend. We got a preview of that game. The Dodgers finally World Series champ. And the Patriots, is the dynasty over? All this and more coming up next on the 1-0 Sports Show. Texas finally 1-0, finally riding for the brand. Although Tom Herman did say they were 1-0 10 times last season. Fine bomb, I'll give him like half a point. Dude, you just, you like okay. fine bomb way too much. Yeah, all right. I'm like you're, fine you're bomb. Fine I'm bomb the fine bomb of the show. <laughs> Um, by the way, that looks... Ohio <laughs> uh, State, <laughs> is that an omen? <laughs> Give me that Longhorn hat. Oh, man! Hook him, baby. All right, he's Hook pulling him. the torso. <laughs> <laughs> uh-uh. Hello, and welcome into the 1-0 Sports Show. I'm your host, Thomas Fitch. Thanks for joining us. On your Friday morning, I'm joined alongside our analysts, John Kelly and Daniel Shee. Guys, Halloween's tomorrow. We have some spooky news, spooky breaking news. I guess it was not as breaking on Friday morning, breaking Thursday night. But the lead story, Trevor Lawrence tests positive for COVID-19. He won't play this weekend. ACC rules say he has to be out 10 days, which technically would mean that he would not be able to play in the showdown against Notre Dame next Saturday. So let's get your thoughts on this. Daniel, we'll start with you. Between uh, Justin Turner and Trevor Lawrence and last week, I still do not, I still cannot understand why sports in America is still happening right now. I mean, I understand that NBA did it really well and, and it props to the NBA, but at this point, have, having the NBA level of success is really the outlier rather than the the norm, and so I just cannot with so with this much craziness happening, and people are, are I just can't understand why sports is happening. But at the same time, as a sports director of a student television <laughs> in a college in a university, I you know that certainly helps our lives, but not not for a lot of people out there in the world that 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 um sports is uh had the, the fact that sports is happening is, is really helping that john what do you think how, how is this going to affect clemson as as they go into some of their their tougher matchups oh this will affect them uh, a lot i think even if uh trevor lawrence comes back by a miracle against this notre dame team he still will if he doesn't have COVID, he's still recovering from this major respiratory disease. And so he definitely, if he, even if he comes back, I don't see him playing to 100%. And I think that could definitely affect this Clemson team against such a strong Notre Dame team, which has pull implications down the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's a 1-4 one, one matchup coming up. And, and, you know, we'll certainly be tuning in to just see what happens with that. And I, you know, I just got an update saying he has mild symptoms, so it's not even an asymptomatic case. So, who knows what's going to happen? That's just 2020 being 2020. But let's do something that we're used to doing, and we're going to start off with who's hot and who's not. So, Daniel, let's start with you. Who is hot? Well, if you know, last time I came on, and both my who's hot, who's nots are, are, are about the CPPL in Taiwan, and I'm staying with that trend, the Uni Lions. Um, of the CPPL, who won the second half season championship on Saturday, our time, uh, last week. And, you know, what what they had to do to win their championship is win two consecutive do-or-die games. On Friday, they, they won against the Fubon Guardians on this two-RBI double by center fielder Chen Jiexian. And on the following day, they faced the first half season champion, the CTPC brothers, at home. And again, it's a do or die moment. And Maya Siru, the veteran, comes up with the go ahead hit in the bottom of the sixth inning that put the Lions up two to one. And all the and the next thing you know, the Lions are throwing the ribbon and throwing the streamers, which is what we do here in Taiwan when they win the championship. And now they're in the Taiwan series starting on on Halloween on October thirty first. That is pretty exciting. Um, and we have a lot more CPBL talk. Hopefully, Daniel will. We'll, we'll explain for us. But from what I can gather, it sounds like things are heating up in, in the CPBL. So, John, who's hot for you? Who's hot for me is third, th- third string quarterbacks on TikTok. This has been a strange phenomenon. It started with Baltimore Ravens third string 
quarterback Trace McSorley, uh, a hype video from his days at Penn State trickled down onto the interwebs, uh, and it took TikTok by storm. Everyone was putting them on their Madden teams, uh, drafting them for fantasy football <laughs> for the lulls. And then just recently, with uh, the unfortunate situation in uh, Dallas with Dak Prescott going out, and then Andy Dalton this past week, Bill DiNucci came in and took TikTok by storm again. <laughs> Unfortunately, not doing much for the Cowboys, <laughs> but doing much for his image on TikTok. Was also the same thing with putting him on Madden. He doesn't even have a picture on Madden, but he's being put up on fantasy teams and all sorts of stuff. Great, great year for third string quarterbacks. <laughs> that is true. I mean, it's crazy that, that Danucci is starting for the Cowboys. And I know I, I don't get a who's not on this show, but I think y'all all know if I had a who's not, it would be for the Cowboys. You know, we, we talk about the NFC East every week, but I mean, that is, that is just absolutely madness that you have a, a rookie out of James Madison starting, um, starting for them. Um, but Daniel, who's not hot for you? Uh, well, I'm going back to the United States for the first time this uh, semester in terms of who's out, who's not. Going to Nebraska football. They're, and during the summer and in the beginning of, of the fall semester, they're the guys that kept on saying, we want football. They kept, they're the guys that kept on telling the Big Ten, we want football, we want football. The Big Ten basically says, you want football? We'll give you the toughest schedule ever. And before you know it, after they lose to Ohio State, they can't even play football anymore because Wisconsin – Wisconsin pulls out due to COVID-19 um, contact tracing. 12, 12 players on the team got, got confirmed, uh, diagnosed with the case cases. And then they go out and say, okay, we'll schedule our own game. Big Ten says, no, you're not. So it's not it's not been a good way from Nebraska. And, again, they are facing one of the toughest schedule in the nation, and yet they will have an empty, or basically a, a, a weekend full of nothing this week. Yeah, they were, they were all excited to get back. I don't know how excited they are after that that Ohio State loss. <laughs> John, who's not hot for you? Who's not for me is the Rangers' new ballpark, uh, Globe Life Field. Uh, it's been on the so national stage. Yeah. It's been on the national stage for the NLCS and the World Series. And after it, we've had sports reporters and fans who attended games for both the NLCS and the World Series coming out and saying just how ugly it is. From the outside, it looks like a barn. From the inside, you know, there's no, like, feeling into it. I mean, uh, compared to uh, Globe Life Park, just across the street, uh, it's just a harsh juxtaposition between uh, a storied ballpark that uh, feels like a classic retro ballpark uh, in that wave of retro ballparks after uh, Camden Yards and to this pigsty. It's, it's really disappointing. Yeah, I know that park has certainly, uh, you know, started a lot of debate online about about how people feel about it, and even if there was a need for a new a new stadium. But we're gonna get into our own debate now, a little embrace debate. And the first topic that we are talking on for embrace debate is the fact that Quinn Ewers, the number one overall player in 2022, quarterback who had committed to Texas, announced yesterday that he would be decommitting from UT. He had this message basically saying um, he's been thinking more about it with COVID-19. He's unsure and wants to, said, wants to decommit to t from Texas and spend more time thinking about it. But, John, we'll start with you getting your thoughts. What do you think is happening here? Uh, you cut out there. Can you repeat the specific? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is happening in this oh. in this situation? Yeah. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of stories on Twitter. You know, we're seeing some people are blaming it on the fans and the current culture that's revolving around this UT uh, team, uh, but also more uh, personal issues with possibly even Coach Herman saying some bad things about uh, Quinn Ewers and that getting down to him. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but the one thing that is certain is that this is devastating for this Texas team going forward. I mean, having the number one uh, person in the nation decommit is not a good look. 
Yeah, it, it certainly isn't. And especially someone who, you know, generally when you have these early commits, they're pretty committed to the university and, and people, there was, there was some reporters who had spoken to him just a couple of days before he decommitted on Wednesday. And he said he was pretty committed. He was very committed, I should say, to UT. A couple of days later, he decommits. Daniel, what's your reaction to all this? Well, to me, um, on the uh, on the competitive side of things, I think Texas's quarterback room is pretty stacked for the foreseeable for the next couple of years. Um, I, I think what I, I think this is just a phenomenon of what uh, uh, college football uh, uh, recruiting has been like. I mean, he's 20, year of twenty twenty two, so he's a sophomore in high school, and he already had committed to UT before this, so. But I'm not sure when he committed, but then if he committed in his freshman year of high school, he was what 14, and you're expecting a person to to make a decision about where he will be until he's 21 at the age at, at the age of 14. I think that's unrealistic, and uh, and I think the word committing and decommitting for a call, for high school freshman is a little bit a little bit too tough and. Um, I understand that it's a bad look on the Texas program, given how they lost to TCU in Oklahoma, and it's supposed to be, you know, Texas's year, and it's not been so far. I understand that, and plus, this is is a big blow. But again, look at the side. If you're if you are expected as as one of the top talent in the nation to be to make a decision at 14 and stay stick with it until age 21, I think that is that is an unrealistic expectation. Well, yeah, but Daniel, how does this reflect on, uh, you know, the recruiting capabilities of Texas? I mean, you know, obviously they're I, able I think, to recruit him from such a young age, and then, but then not be able to, you know, communicate with him or have him at least stick with the University of Texas. Uh, I, how I does think, that? How does that vary for maybe senior uh, seniors in high school who are looking to commit to UT? And, and I understand where you're coming from, and and to me. I think recruiting is a, I mean, I, okay, I'm looking at this from, I'm not, I've never been recruited by anybody, but to me, recruiting is a lot like, uh, uh, like our, our job is packaging a program to, to uh, an audience in terms of if, if you're the recruiting team, you're packaging the program to your recruiting players. If you're a media, you're packaging the program, packaging the game to, to the, to the mass audience. And if the product on the field isn't reflecting the program well, I don't care what you do on the recruiting trail. If it, it, I mean, you can, you can, you know, if you're Tom Herman, you can say, okay, we're building a program, we're building a program. But he's been here for a while, and looks like right now, the, this program is not headed where he promised it would, it would go. That's not, that's not up to the, 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 the recruiting team. That's up to, that's up to what's being put on the field by the coaching staff. And so, if they're not winning on the field, like, again, winning solves everything, and but then they're not winning, winning right now, and. Um, and, and so I, I think again, you're looking at a player that you you're sold you sold this vision to a 14 year old. He bought into the vision, and now you're not translating that vision on the field as we speak. He's still he's still a sophomore in high school. If he comments now, he's got at least two years, maybe a year left to make his decision. You can't you. It's I, I think it's unbelievable how how Texas fan base had reacted to this again. Nobody should be made should be made, should make a decision at age fourteen that would affect him basically for the rest of his life. Yeah, well, regardless of of why the decision happened, Tom Herman's certainly on the hot seat for that. But another another team who's on the hot seat are the Dodgers, who are in hot water because Justin Turner, who tested positive for COVID, you can see here, had to be removed um, during the game then came out afterwards and was celebrating with the team on the field. John, we'll start with you. What should happen to the Dodgers for this? I mean, <laughs> uh, the MLB certainly, uh, you know, not known for giving out uh, reasonable punishments. Uh, so, you know, for this, you know, the Dodgers will probably not be able to play next season, you know. <laughs> uh, disqualified from any future World Series in the next couple of years. All jokes, of course. Uh, I mean, I don't think any... Maybe a fine. Uh, I get it. I mean, the Dodgers were irresponsible. 
this is a, a wide stage that they're on and they're having this person who's been diagnosed with this disease. Already there's a lot of misinformation uh, in this country about COVID-19 and you're having him come on the field and celebrate. At the same time, he, he did just contribute to a World Series victory. Uh, so, you know, maybe if there was a conversation with the players beforehand that they're okay with this, then uh, fine. Uh, but I do think it was reckless, especially when there's so much misinformation in the United States today. Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough because, you know, in, in one way you could say, well, I was just, you know, you could say I was just in the dugout with you guys. What difference does it make if it's on the field? But when, when, those, when the, the, the news is out there that you're positive, it's a bad look and, and you're putting more people at risk. Daniel, what are your thoughts? I, I think the most punishment the MLB is going to give is a fine. Um, at the same time, uh, the Dodgers basically – Except for Justin Turner, in you know, after the eighth inning, coming back out to celebrate, um, that's the only regulation that they breached. You know, that's the only rule that that they really broken. Other than that, they you know they they were giving you know, they were sending tests. They they were reporting their test results to the league, and and they've been staying at the hotel. Reportedly, they've been doing everything that what they were told to do. So, um, on that front, uh, you know, I think the most MLB can do is to find the Dodgers. But again, it's a Magic Johnson franchise. I think a, a ten thousand, you know, couple thousand dollars here and there. It's not going to hurt them at all, especially after the World Series. It's probably the least of their concern. What concerns me the most is you got uh, Ro- Dave Roberts, who who just uh, who is a cancer survivor, sitting right next to Justin Turner, and you got Clint Kershaw's what two year old son who's also on the field celebrating. You got people kissing, hugging doing whatever they need to do on the field, Justin Turner being one of them, taking his mask off. I think really the, the biggest punishment will be COVID-19. If, you know, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 side of things, the health concern side of things, rather than the MLB laying the hammer. Because as we all know, it will be ridiculous if they somehow take the championship away, but not with the Astros. Because by the end, at the end of the day, it's a piece of metal, right? Yeah. Well, COVID was not the only controversy in this game. One of the biggest storylines from this game was Blake Snell, who had been pitching um, a phenomenal game, and then in the sixth inning gets pulled after giving up a little bloop single. So, Daniel, we'll start with you. Does the Rays have kept Snell in, and, and does that change the result of this game? Texas fans, I want to draw this picture for you, okay? Sam Ellinger, imagine Sam Ellinger, right, who's a Heisman, Heisman quarterback in, in preseason, right? And then and they, you're facing Oklahoma or you're going into the college football playoff, you're facing Clemson, and then by the fourth quarter or bit middle of the third quarter, your team is up, you know, 14 to 7, right? And then maybe, you know, you, you know, by you know, and you have to you take the ball in the twenty fifth yard line, twenty five yeah, twenty fifth yard line, and then probably third and eight. And Tom Herman said, "No, you know what? You know what? No, Sam Allen, you're not playing this game. I, we will give the ball to Casey Thompson for the rest of the game against uh, you know in a college football playoff. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if that happened? I had you know I I could not believe what my eyes were seeing." I, I've always had the theory that if you're going to lose, you lose with the best players on the field. And on, on in game six between the Dodgers and the, the Rays, the Rays did not lose with their best player on the mound for them. And I think that's a shame. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree that, that they should have kept Snell. I, I'm not exactly sure about your analogy with quarterbacks because you don't normally pull a quarterback three quarters of the game and say, all right, Casey Thompson, he's a reliever. And then we're going to bring in – you know, Hudson Card, he's the closer don't, for the last two minutes. You don't you don't pull a Cy Young winner who's been dominant in the first six innings out of a game six elimination. I mean, it just it just uh Yeah. John, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think I don't know, I I also disagree with that analogy a bit because we're talking about going to a bullpen of the American League champions. You know, it's it's not like you're going to a, a second string quarterback who uh, you know, hasn't played uh, much at all. Um, I think in the moment, 
I think uh, it might have seemed like a better decision than it does in hindsight. Hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, what the Rays were looking for were to get out of this game. And, you know, he had already pitched six innings. You know, you have a guy, uh, a single. Uh, I think in the moment it was probably a good decision, but in hindsight it wasn't. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's always the 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 debate of you know. Again, if the Rays the Rays go on to win the game, nobody's questioning the decision. The stakes are so high, and this man had pitched six innings already. So you know, I mean, you have a bullpen of talented pitchers. Uh, well, you also had the most talented pitcher on your, on your team on the mound, and he's well like at six. I I mean, it was like 109 pitches by the sixth inning. That's the different story, but then he was nowhere close to that, right? And yeah, but there's also I the mean, stress. I mean, he could I, have also I, been having, you know. Listen, I mean, I, I, all, all I'm saying is, if Blake Snell was the one that gave up the lead, this narrative would had would not have been should have they gone to the bullpen because Blake Snell had been dominating. He's a Cy Young winner, and he's a guy you relied on. He he's a guy that you rely on uh, in, a, in a in an elimination game. If it, it, it it's Clayton Kershaw back in 2011, like if he hadn't blow that many playoff leads by by this point, it was back in 2011. One of the you know during uh, during his prime, and you pull him out the sixth inning, and the Dodgers lose. The the Dodgers would have would have had enough the same amount of blame as the Rays did today. Um, it just it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. To me. And analytics guys will come in and and disagree, but. Analytics but, and base, mean, they didn't play and, in the playoffs had not worked well. You know, it's baseball. Obviously, if you kept him in the game and the Rays won, he wouldn't be pitching game seven. So he, he could have came in, in in like the ninth. You know, like I, I think in, in game seven, he would have been in the bullpen being one of those options. Obviously, you probably won't put it in the fourth inning, you know, but again, it was a one to nothing. It wasn't like they were up six to nothing. You want to save them to four to four tomorrow. It's a one to nothing game and you needed, you needed to win that game. So at this point, it, you don't, you don't think about tomorrow until you win. Yeah. Well, you know, again, at the end of the day, it, it didn't work. And you know, the Ray, you know, Rays are going to have to live with that. Um, let's, let's go to the NFL though, for our last topic of embrace debate, the Patriots. Were they were a dynasty? Cam Newton came in first two games, looked pretty good, but they've struggled since then. They have now lost three games in a row. That's their first time since 2002 losing three straight games. Cam Newton had just a terrible game. Meanwhile, Tom Brady living it up in Tampa. They're five and two. So, Daniel, we'll start with you. Is the Pats dynasty over? Oh, I, I think you don't say that until next year. I, I think, I, I think having one off year, you know, in in a you know in twenty years, you know, you know, I don't think that means the dynasty is over. If they continue to be dominant next year, and then the year after that, year after that, you're just going to see this year as an off year. So I, I don't think I, I don't you can I don't think you can just write go out and say the dynasty is over at this point. I think it's you know if you know back if, if, to refer to Max Kellerman, I think there's they're approaching the cliff, but then. You know, they might not jump off it. You know, they can, they might still come back. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a good point. But, I mean, behind Cam Newton, there, there's there's not a quarterback in waiting, you know, right. to, to replace Trevor him. Trevor <laughs> Maybe. I mean, could you imagine what Bill Belichick could turn Trevor Lawrence into? It'd be pretty crazy. John, do you think the dynasty's over? Now, I do want to preface this by saying I had Cam Newton in as a backup this week in fantasy football. And that <laughs> negative 0.18 points ain't feeling too great. But I, I do think unless unless there's change in this Patriots team, uh, the Pats dynasty we knew is over. And I think it's time, you know, we have these fresh new faces in the AFC to take up the reins of this dominant team. We have the Chiefs. We have the Ravens. We have the Patriots. I mean, not the 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 Steelers. Uh, great teams, and they're it's it's an exciting time for AFC fans. There's no longer, uh, you know, the Patriots will go to the Super Bowl as always, and I think the Patriots dynasty as we knew it is over, and that's a good thing for this a for the AFC. 
Yeah, it certainly open opens things up for for a lot of teams. And, and right now, it is there, there's a lot of teams in the AFC and even in the, in the NFC that can that can really contend with that. Anyways, that's all we got for embrace debate. Coming up next, we have Texas Oklahoma State preview with Ocali sports reporter for Oklahoma State, Lanny Gerber. Stick around; you're not going to want to miss it. No sports show, and now joining us, uh, Lainey Gerber. She is sports reporter, sports host for the Ocali, does the pregame show um, for Oklahoma State. Lainey, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. This is my first time being the guest on a show at another school, so this is fun. Yeah, we're glad to have you. All right, so so before we get into th- anything, let's start about start talking about the Tulsa game. Okay. I want to talk, what was the panic level after the Tulsa game? And then what's been the transition to now Oklahoma state looking like potentially a college football playoff team? Yeah. I mean, the Tulsa game was really rough in the beginning with our QB one Spencer Sanders getting hurt after the first play of the game. Um, But when Shane Illingworth came in, it took him a while to come in because they didn't want him to play because he missed practice due to COVID-19 contact tracing. But they put him in and he performed really well. So sadly, the game didn't go too well because Shane came in so late. But once he came in, he looked really great. So the game wasn't all of that concerning because we knew Shane would probably be playing for a few games after that. And we all really trusted him after that game. Hey, Lenny, Daniel here. And um, you talk about the arc of the season so far you now. Um, your starting quarterback was injured, and now game two back from injury for Spencer Sanders. What are your expectations um, for him in the Saturday game versus Texas? Mm-hmm. I expect it to be a lot smoother. Um, the game last week was actually Spencer's first full game in an entire year because last year he hurt his thumb and couldn't play for a while, and then he still wasn't playing full games even when he came back. So that was his first full game in an entire year. And there was a little bit of rust. He threw two interceptions. But we expect this weekend's game to be a lot more put together. He's had more time. He's played a full game. Uh, The team surrounding him is just so great. He doesn't have as much pressure on him. So we just expect it to be a lot smoother. We expect Spencer to throw the ball more and trust himself. And he's been running the ball really well himself. And that's why we have him. So. Hi, Lenny. John here. So obviously, as you mentioned, Spencer Sanders has been doing wonders for this offense, but it's really been the defense that has provided strength for this Oklahoma State team this year. And how much of a surprise has that been for you? Oh, my gosh. I mean, most of our defense is returning from last year anyway, but no one really expected this. Uh, They're all really talented guys. They're all very versatile. I mean, our linebackers are making interceptions. Our safeties are just so locked down that other quarterbacks haven't even been able to throw to their receivers because they're just in such tight coverage. So they just have a lot of really good skill sets. They're able to move guys around if they want to. And that's allowed our defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles, to run a lot of defensive schemes that can really go in so many directions. And I think that's been the key to this season is almost everything that can happen on the field um, defensively kind of has a way of being able to be played out and they're all just ready for it. I think a big reason why we're ranked number six right now is because of this defense, especially when your quarterback system in the beginning is so changing with not knowing who's going to start every week until Spencer came back last week. It's definitely been the defense holding it down. Yeah. And you mentioned that number six ranking Oklahoma state first in the big 12 and really the big 12's only chance remaining of getting a team in the college football playoff. What do you think Oklahoma's chance, Oklahoma state's chances are at the big 12 championship and at making a run towards the college football playoff? Mm-hmm. First of all, I know it's hard for you to have to say that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I know it hurts. I, I, I understand, but not this year. I don't understand this year. We're doing great. <laughs> But yeah, um, no, we definitely have, I can see us totally making it to the Big 12 championship at the end of the year, barring we don't know when it's going to get played because it seems like games keep getting pushed back due to COVID. 
But I definitely think we could be there. As far as the college football playoff run goes, uh, we'll be. it could be close. Uh, we're getting into our more competitive games now. Uh, Iowa State was really our first big test last weekend, playing a number 16 ranked team. Um, but yeah, it's just hard. I don't know if we're going to be able to make it up to the top four and get past Sunshine and Trevor Lawrence up in Clemson and the other team. Ohio State just started playing, so – the Big Ten and Pac-12 teams are going to make the scheduling a little complicated. So if we can make a CFP run, that'd be great. I just don't know if we can break that number four barrier, but I'm here for it. If it happens, it happens. <laughs> well, before we get into Texas-Oklahoma uh, State game, that's how we call it here on this side of the, of the border, um, uh, let's, talk about, let's talk about how COVID has impacted you guys as a student media. You know, we've all, we're all running student media here, and it's really tough to cover games in 2020. How do you guys up there in Stillwater um, cope with this pandemic? It's been rough. I think our student media is very broad here, so everyone's really just had to pick their kind of job and stick with it and really connect with everyone. Like, uh, it's like me personally, I can't go to games and film them now for stories, which before it was, okay, you want to do a story, like you go, you film everything, you know, you get all your interviews, you do your stand-ups, you put it all together, you know, you're doing everything. But now since we can't be at football games, we have a student run or athletics has like a student run video group. And so we get our videos through them now. So for highlights and things, we're at the mercy of what they have, but they do an excellent job. So it's totally fine. And it, saves you from standing there for four hours filming a football game every Saturday. So that part's kind of nice. Um, show wise, you know, we have like our studio is kind of big. It's big enough to have a desk, a news desk on either side of the studio. So we've just had to separate people doing shows, less interviews and things like that, less people coming in. We have a lot less access to athletes now, which actually has become like a really big issue because even though Zoom is a thing, their media availability is just so different now. And their practice schedules are so different because groups are being separated during practice. So it's a little wild, but yeah, everyone's made it manage. Really the toughest part is just as a student media person, not being able to use the athletic facilities for my reasons for filming stand up, doing stories and things like that. And anything that I wanted to do interactively with any players on the team had to get scratched. So really right now it's just Zoom stuff and trying to make Zoom work for whatever we're doing as best as possible, <laughs> like this. <laughs> awesome, so back to the good iron. Obviously Oklahoma State's the number six team in the nation. <laughs> Somebody thinks that they're good, <laughs> a lot of people do. Uh, what in your mind is the best and the worst part of this Oklahoma State team? Hmm, that's a really good question. The best part I would have to say is I'm going to, I feel like saying our defense is kind of expected, but I'm going to go with our defense and I'm going to go with our secondary because they, like I mentioned earlier, they've just been kind of so on lock, you know, with the interceptions and just past breakups too have been so wild these last few games even though before the Iowa State game, the game we played before that against West Virginia was three weeks before because we had two off weeks because of COVID. But yeah, the secondary has just been so locked down. They've been right on top of their men to where opposing quarterbacks, like I said, can't even throw to their receivers. So OSU's like against the pass, our defense has just been really good. And the Big 12 is a big air raid conference, as we know. So it's definitely different to see. And I think that's really helped a lot of quarterback or us against a lot of quarterbacks, especially like last week facing Brock Purdy, who loves to air raid with the ball. Um, the yeah. lowest part, sorry, you asked about the lowest part too, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the lowest part I would say has probably, it's definitely on the offensive side, but I think, you know, having to go to a quarterback that you just weren't expecting to really play this year is rough in itself. Um, the first few games before Iowa State, really, or before Kansas, really, um, the offense just kind of seemed lethargic. You know, we have Chuba Hubbard, we have Tylen Wallace, Shane Illingworth is proving to be a great quarterback with a great arm for being a true freshman. But yeah, it just seemed lethargic. There were holes. The only person that was really well put together was our backup running back, LD Brown, who was doing great things for us, especially when now opposing defenses are aware of Chuba Hubbard and are just stacking him. Like it's insane. 
Um, so LD was doing great for us. But yeah, the offense was just shaky. And then I think the Kansas game, because it is Kansas, the Kansas game really allowed our offense to take off. And even though we didn't expect Kansas to be a big issue, we played them the way the number one team in the Big 12 should be playing them. So that was a big positive for our offense. And then last week against Iowa State, being able to capitalize on the Cyclones' mistakes and just taking advantage and getting things done where they need to get done. And our last touchdown came on only four plays. So it's really coming together. But that's kind of the weak side just because I guess it's taken four games to kind of feel that way. Yeah, so looking at Saturday's game, what would you say is the matchup to watch for between Texas and Oklahoma State? Mm -hmm. Who I would say it's going to be because you guys like to run the ball a lot this season. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say it's between our front seven on defense and then your guys' run game, whether – and I know um, Sam Ellinger is your guys' leading rusher right now. So really I think it's going to be a lot of QB reads. I think that um, – our defense is just going to try to figure out how to, you know, stop him from running the ball. But then also, if you just keep going after Sam Ellinger, then they're just going to figure it out and go other ways. So I really think it's just going to be like the run defense and our secondaries are pretty locked down. So that's going to kind of take away one of Sam's big options. So, yeah, I think it's going to go just the run defense. I think that's going to be it. We have some pretty powerful linebackers and guys up front. So it'll just be interesting to see how everyone tries to figure each other out on both sides of the ball. You mentioned how Oklahoma State's defense has really sh um, shown up th this season. If you compare the defense uh, for Texas and uh, the Oklahoma State defense, um, how do you how, how how do you compare those, and who will show up bigger in the game? Mm -hmm. Well, I have noticed with Texas's defense, uh, most of your guys' tackles come from. Uh, linebackers and defensive backs versus most of our tackles have come from a lot of been linebackers, but also secondary guys have really been getting a lot of tackles because like I said, the big 12 is such a pass rush, uh, heavy, not sorry, not a pass rush, such a, a pass heavy conference. So I think that that's going to be a big thing. To, yeah. I'm trying to like think about how I want to word this, but yeah. I think that'll be it for sure. Obviously, quarterbacks are the cornerstone of any offense. And with Spencer Sanders and Sam Ellinger, it'll certainly be an interesting game. But who do you think will have the better game of the two? Yeah, um, that's rough. I mean, I know Sam's a really good looking quarterback. He's, <laughs> he's not like <laughs> not like physically, like as a as a football player, he's he looks great. He's um, really good, good looking. I mean, he he's <laughs> he's a looker. Uh, that's your time. That's your time. <laughs> but yeah, no, he's been talked about ever since he got into UT. So um, it'll be a rough. I hope that Spencer looks great. He looked really good last game. Like I said, he likes to run the ball, which is, you know, running quarterbacks are the, pe the present in the future. So he's been looking great. Um, but, you know, Sam's been running the ball a lot, too. So it's going to be really rough. Like I said, Spencer had some rust last week, and I'm hoping it's all gone. He started looking a lot better towards the end of the game, for sure. A lot of us agreed on that. So I'm hoping – I'm going to hope that it's Spencer. I'm going to hope that if he got rid of all this rust from last week, then I think it'll be Spencer because he is so well-rounded and he's able to feel less pressure because his defense is just so locked down. He doesn't have to worry so much about catching up. So – I'm going to go with Spencer. But Sam is a very solid quarterback. So, and good looking one, too. <laughs> good looking one, too. <laughs> All right, lady, we got to know what is your score prediction for Saturday? Oh, my gosh. Okay. My dad and I were talking about this earlier. I'm pretty sure I said 38 to 27 OSU. Um, I think, yeah, it's going to be a medium kind of scoring game. You know, that's not too high. Um, but it's not super low. It's about where, like, you know, games usually stand in the Big 12. So I know ESPN had the line at OSU by three and a half. So, but I went with 38 27. I think we can get all those touchdowns. I think we can hold UT. Uh, at first, I had UT with an extra one, but I think that our defense can hold it off. But then uh, Texas is going to make it up with a couple field goals there. 
All right, so last question from all of us. Uh, so my, Mike Gundy has really built the Oklahoma State program. If you know, I'm a Yankee fan, so I use this phrase a lot. But Oklahoma State is basically the the house that that Mike Gundy built. It, it looks like it from 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 this side of the border. Um, where does Mike Gundy rank in terms of in the world of college football? Do you think in terms of coaches? Oh my gosh, um, I think he is getting more respect in the terms of coaches. It came out, I think it was last week that he has the like the third most wins amongst uh, college uh, college head coaches against top 25 teams. And he just caught up with Nick Saban and Davis Sweeney. So that's an impressive stat in itself. And Mike's been here for a while and he's had multiple really good teams. I mean, there's that 2011 team that, you know, things happen towards the end of the season, but they're really good. They're ranked number two in the nation at one point. And he was there for that. And there are some, there are a few little low seasons in there, but that happens to every college program. And he was able to, yeah, just somehow rebuild it with his recruiting scheme that gets questioned a lot because he's a guy that goes out. He looks for the the Mason Rudolphs and the three stars that, you know, that with an extra year of work would have been five stars. He looks for those guys. So which a lot of times can be diamonds in the rough. It takes a lot of work and people question him. But here we are a few years later after a couple questionable seasons, even though they were still winning seasons, they just weren't the prettiest. And now we have a number six ranked team again, which I haven't seen since four years ago. We were ranked three years ago, sorry. We were number six in the beginning of the season, but then it slowly fell down. So the fact that we've been working our way up to this is also a very promising sign. Yeah, no matter where he ranks from uh, among college football coaches, his mullet is number one. You can't exactly. top that. <laughs> actually cut it a little bit it's not really super mullety anymore it's just kind of like long and fluffy in the back i don't like it I'm so sad. <laughs> that's a shame well laney thanks so much for joining us and y'all make sure you check out pregame report is that what it's called yes the pregame report pregame report on ocali um that is that's oklahoma state student tv productions but laney thanks so much for joining us yeah no problem thank you guys again so much for having me this was so fun Welcome back into the 1-0 Sports Show. Now it's the time we know that you all tuned in for. It is questions from the crowd. You gave us your questions. We're about to give you the answers that we know you've been dying to hear. First question, this one comes from our own Justin Morris at Justin Morris underscore Texas. And here's what he said. He said, what is y'all's way too early bowl prediction for Texas? John, we'll start with you. I think we're going to have uh, the same situation as last year. I think Texas will be able to come back up in the Big 12, but not a lot. I think we're going to the Valero Alamo Bowl. Daniel, you disagree? I have my way lower. I have been going to the Lockheed Martin Armed Forces Bowl versus Ooh, SMU and Shane Bouchelle in oh, sh- no. against Shane Bouchelle in SA. Hey, it's it's what a story it would be. Sam Ellinger and Shane Bouchelle both in their senior years going at it in a in a football game, and uh, I think that's a great story for a lot of people. That would be that would be a fun uh, a fun storyline to get to. Um, our next question is from recurring guest Derek Duke twenty five says, when does CDC change the locks on Tom Herman's office? <laughs> Daniel, we'll start with you. Is Herman on his way out? Well, it depends on if he's confirmed with the virus. You know, they have to fly in all the way from D.C., and that's not a good – that's not a short flight, you know? The, you can't just – I don't think a government agency can just come in and change the lock. Oh, wait, we're talking about Chris Conte or what? Uh <laughs> Oh, well, oh, I think okay. he meant Chris okay. Conte. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I, I, I don't think Tom Arman goes after this year. Um, first of all, he just hired new assistants that they did not – they were not allowed to, to install the new system during the summer because of COVID. And during the COVID-19, uh, even Texas had huge losses. And they're, they're not, I don't think they're spending that much money to buy out a football coach. So I don't think uh, Tom Arman goes after this year. 
John, do you agree? Uh, I agree, but I have some uh, limits on that. I'd say if we're able, if Texas is able to, you know, work out the adjustments with the new coordinators next year, if there's no Big 12 championship next year, 2021, get them out of here, throw them out, kick them to the curb. So you, you think there's a little bit of a grace period, but not much? Yeah. The, the Big 12 championship is an absolute in 2021. Yeah. Obviously, this year is uh, not looking too great for the chances of the Big 12 championship. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, you do have to remember the fact that he did bring in two new coordinators and, you know, there was no spring practice for that. So, you know, that's, I feel like it's a factor that people aren't necessarily um, giving Herman the benefit of the doubt for. But when you're losing recruits and you're losing games, it's hard to argue for, for sticking around. Our next question comes from TSTV alum Josh Martella asking about the Dallas Stars new alternates, hot or mess. Let's check out this announcements video and, and then we'll get y'all's, um, y'all's opinions on these new unis. All right, John, what do you think? Uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword for me. Close up and like in that intro video, I love that color green, and I think it's great. Unfortunately for that color green, in certain lights, it kind of looks like urine. and <laughs> I think that's where a lot of the uh, problems with the jersey come. Uh, so close up, it looks great. Far away, not having it. Daniel, you seem to disagree with that. Oh, I, I, I choose to keep my verdict on this until I see them in a hockey rink. Um, you know, there's a, I think there's a reason why in the promo video they stuck, they stay, they kept the jersey with the, the confines of a black box. Because, I mean, I think it looks really, it would look really good in, in a club, like a nightclub. But unless you're going to make a hockey rink, a hockey re- arena, a, a, a nightclub during the game, which I don't think is the safest way to play hockey, to be honest, then <laughs> I I don't think with the lighting it's going to work well. But, again, I hold my verdict on that because I'm, I'm curious. To, I'm willing to give it a shot. And, and if it works well I, in, in the rink, I, I think I'll dig it. Yeah, I mean, you can. It, it's a cool video, and you kind of see what they're going for um, in the video. I think my opinion is any time when you go with like a dark color and a neon, you just run the risk of kind of getting that like JV knockoff video game, create your own uniform look. And they're right on that borderline of just looking not quite professional. And I, it, it is an alternate uniform, but I think it's kind of towing that line. All right. Our next question, this comes from infield fly girl. She said, how many bunt attempts from number four hitters are we going to see? in the Taiwan series. Uh, right. Daniel, we'll start with you. All right. So shout out to Infield Fly Girl, one of the key members of CPPR Twitter. Uh, basically, the, well, if for, for those who are watching that probably doesn't understand, uh, C- the CPPL is a lot more bunting orientated, a lot more small ball than the MLB these days with analytics and pulling your Cy Young pitcher in the sixth inning of a game six of the World Series. So um, so that's why this, I, I think I would say the over under at one and a half um, for uh, for the full series. And I think that's probably, you know, at, that's hard to fathom if you're, if you're only watching the MLB, you know, hawking a cleanup hitter bunt, but that could happen. So I'm going to go with the over on one and a half. I, I don't know what you guys think. John? I'm agree with, oh. I'm agree with you, Daniel. I'm gonna take the over. Uh, you seem confident in that, and I mean it makes for good television. So, yeah, like I always say, whenever we're talking about the CPBL, Daniel knows way more than me. But you know, it's just to be fun. I'll I'll, I'll be a little contrarian <laughs> to you, John. I'm gonna take the under. I'm gonna take the under. Not a lot of bunts. Yeah. Only dingers. Yeah. All right. Our next question, this is from uh, at Chin Ryan. Ryan Chin said, 
Um, he said NFL TBD, you know, depending on the playoffs this year, but which professional league's current playoff format is the most exciting and which is the most fan friendly? And John, we'll start with you on this. Mm, uh, professionally, I think the MLB uh, playoff format this year was good with uh, the top two teams, I believe, in each uh, division plus some wild cards. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to the uh, FCS 16 team. Uh, I know I talk a lot about changing the uh, FBS uh, ch- uh, playoff format, but I think uh, lowering it to 16 teams in the FCS, uh, it'll, it's a good look and it's something the FBS should consider. Absolutely. Daniel, what's your thoughts? I hate all of them. I really do. I hate every one of them. I thought the NFL really had the best format, and I thought the MLB, like, okay, I, I think their plan is to stick with the 16-team format, but I absolutely hated it. You can't have an like a team like the Astros who's under 500 during the regular season to make it all the way to the ALCS. I don't think that's – I don't think that is – Good. I don't think that's good for the sport. And I, you, you, if you guys know me, I absolutely hate the NBA playoffs. I thought the first two rounds are just a total waste of time. It's just a, a money grab for the league and the teams. I again, I thought the NFL, the MLB, you know, a third of the league make the, making the playoffs is the perfect is the perfect way to do it. Especially when you count that the wild card teams are one game away from being being eliminated. So I think that is the perfect way to do it. I hate this. I hate the fact that over half the teams in a in a professional league make the playoffs. I think that is a total waste of time and total waste of energy. And by the way, if you're not over 500, you should not be allowed to compete for a championship. Yeah, little little subliminal messaging at the the, uh, at the Houston Astros. Um, our final question comes from S. Kramer Wright. Says, can the Lions win the series without winning Melville's game on? Game one start, and I'm assuming he's not meaning the Detroit Lions. Daniel, you got some more info <laughs> on, on this for us? Yeah, the Uni Lions that I mentioned in uh, A Block uh, in, in the beginning of the show for my who's hot, who's not. Uh, yeah, the, one of the pitchers called Tim Millville, and he was absolutely lights out in the game versus the Guardians, 123 pitch shutout um, that kept the bullpen fresh for the following day. I don't think Melville, in my opinion, I think they go with Teddy Stankwitz in game one, Melville game two, because Stankwitz, he's more, is better at home, and he's, you're guaranteed a start at home if you start game one. So if Melville goes game, game one, I think the only, uh, also depending on the starting pitcher for the, for the brothers, I think the only way the Lions can win is if Errol Miranda is pitching game one for the brothers, and that means you're probably going to lose game two and game three. And then, so you're going to game four and five being down two and one. I think that's a really, really tough ask. Um, I, I think it's possible. I just don't think it is that possible. At the same time, I, I, don't, I, I have the brothers in five. Oh, never mind. I don't have, I am not going to give out my predictions just yet. But, you're getting ahead uh, of yourself. Yeah, but, but I, I, I think the Lions will have a really tough series ahead of them. John, what do you think the Lions are going to do? <laughs> uh, not win, <laughs> and and it's, it's hard. Winning's hard, man. Winning's Winning hard. is hard. Herman, Herman, Tom Herman has taught us that. Um, and I, again, I think we're just going to cede Daniel to your your expertise here um, on the CPBL. When we come back, we have what's trending. We have top plays, college football playoff picks, and we have our spread picks. So you're going to want to make sure you stick around. <laughs> Welcome back in to the one and O sports show again, Thomas Fitch joined alongside John Kelly and Daniel. She, and you know what it's time for time for what's trending. We're going to look at what's trending. We're going to look at thumbs up, thumbs down, everything that's been big in any and every social media world. And starting off CPBL hype video, pretty hype. Y'all go ahead and check this out.
pretty hyped stuff. And Daniel, for those who may not be fully aware with what the Taiwan series is, you want to give us a little recap on what that is? Yeah, so it's the World Series in Taiwan, but then we don't call ourselves the world, you know, because we we well, we know better. Um, it's it's the finals of, of the CPPL, uh, um, the Taiwanese Baseball League, and we, again we got the Uni Lions versus the CTPC brothers. The brothers had been had lost the Taiwan Series in each of the last six years. The Uni Lions were more of an underdog coming into the season. Um, they won their second half by one game. And uh, in the last game of the second half, and they, they really actually they they won the half season with the lowest winning percentage in the league history. I, I think that speaks more about the the strength of the league rather than rather than about the Lions. But again, I think is we're we're up for incredible uh, incredible Taiwan series. And by the way, that video was uh, uh, not easy to make. So uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Yeah, I certainly feel hyped up. You uh, you, you did a fantastic job. Um, on that video, Daniel. Now let's get to a thumbs down. Let's talk with about someone who did a bad job or just a crazy job. This the Dodgers parade afterwards, or just in the celebration. We got a car doing donuts over fireworks. Fireworks explode under oh the car god. and it catches on fire. Oh my god! Think about this. This is oh just crazy. I mean, I, I this is in LA, right? So this is not Jeff Berger in and, and and Jonathan Thomas on for um, <laughs> CBS and KXN. Yeah, it's in LA. <laughs> I mean, I'll I mean, tell you I've, what. Go ahead, John. I've only had the pleasure of seeing you know uh, championship celebrations once, and I was in Cleveland following the uh, finals in 2016. I think. Uh, where everyone was just flooding down the field, and I never thought I'd say good things about Cleveland, but they did a, they, they were doing a fine job of not setting cars on fire, and that's they're a, putting yeah. Philadelphia to shame. Cleveland. But uh, yeah, that's a be bashing Cleveland, but uh, this is it's too far. It's it's unnecessary. I mean, yeah, yeah, Daniel, I agree with you. Definitely feels like something you would you would see in Philadelphia. Uh, <laughs> Not not much better than seeing fans just celebrate and go crazy and just throw caution to the wind and say, you know what, who cares what happens tomorrow? Tonight we won. Uh, just crazy stuff. All right, let's get to a thumbs up. This is a pretty cool, um, really awesome thumbs up. Ron Rivera finished his final cancer treatment. Um, always incredible to see this happen and pretty incredible story just the fact that he's been coaching the Washington football team this season despite going through those treatments that's pretty awesome what do y'all think about this I again by the way uh, uh props to the Washington football team props to Ron Rivera um uh, it's an uh, incredibly uh, uh it, it's really what you know news like this is what really helps sports every now and then and also, you guys are uh, – you guys, meaning Thomas, you're a Washington football fan, just half a game away from the top of the NFC East and we're to go into the playoffs. So maybe a Super Bowl in Washington? I mean, I mean, it's possible. Hey, and our next four weeks, all the teams under 500. So there's a chance. Every team in the NFC East are under 500. Yeah. John, what did you think about watching this video? Uh, this is really heartwarming, uh, especially – in a year, in a season that's just been marked with tragedy and, you know, despair with COVID, with Dak Prescott, you know, having a, a good story like this and, you know, props to Ron Rivera for, you know, pulling through and beating cancer. Uh, it's really great. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome to see an awesome, just awesome story. Speaking of awesome, better than some top plays. So let's go ahead and take a look at the top 10 plays from this past week. Coming in at number 10, little CPBL action here for you, Daniel. That is Teddy Stankwitz. I hope I pronounced that right, probably close enough. Nice little spin move and, and gets the bunt out. At number nine, Seahawks and Cardinals. One of the crazier plays from the weekend 
DK Metcalf chasing down Buda Baker on the Russell Wilson interception, saving the touchdown. Crazy speed there from DK. Number eight, Mookie Betts doing Mookie Betts things and making tough plays look pretty easy. Going up looking like a receiver, getting the extension over the head, makes the catch. Pretty incredible play from Betts. He's been doing that all postseason long. Number seven, again, Cardinals and Seahawks. Watch this throw. Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins, corner of the end zone for the touchdown. And watch on this replay. You can see Kyler Murray sees Hopkins in man coverage, starts smiling because he knows what Hopkins can do there and obviously gets the touchdown. Number six, this is Hassan Haskins, Michigan running back. Gets through the tackle, some room to run. Minnesota defenders would get to him, but watch how they have to bring him down. It takes three defenders total. They almost force him into the split to break him down. Good run there by Haskins. Number five, again, Tampa Bay and Dodgers. This time, not a player, but a fan. Yeah, watch this ball coming around the net there. Makes the nice grab and nice play. Number four. This is Florida State and Louisville. And watch this play. Little juke move. Another in for the touchdown for Florida State. And you can watch. You can see here for Travis. He can bobbles the snap and dribbles and almost crosses up the defenders before being able to get in for the touchdown. Although Florida State would get killed in that game. Number three, LSU and South Carolina. LSU just trying to put this game away. Almost fumbles the kickoff attempt. But watch this. Get some momentum. Kicker beats the rest of the Gamecock crew to the other side of the field, down the sideline, and into the end zone for the touchdown. Incredible play there. Number two, Browns, Bengals, end of the game. Jones in the end zone, the walk-off victory for the Browns. And number one, watch this play. Smith and Jigba in the corner. Watch this catch. Officially, originally ruled out of bounds, but they went back. And the touchdown. Just an incredible play there from Smith and Jigba. Guys, reactions to top 10 plays. John, what did you think? Uh, they were all exciting. This was certainly an exciting week in sports. Uh, I really like seeing uh, DK Metcalf's uh, speedster uh, chase after that interception. Uh, it was my highlight, personally. A lot of great yeah, memes I... coming out of that. Mm-hmm. And Daniel, we got you some some CPBL into the top ten, so you're welcome for that. Yeah, I, I was going to say I, I need to I need to give credit to what credit is due. Thomas, the, the executive producer of the show. It's, Man, you, I mean, you, I'm, I've am i been relentless this week. I'm putting CPPL content, and Thomas has been more than welcome, welcoming on that front, so I, I can't thank him enough for that. Well, you brought the CPPL fans to us, so we're going to give you the content you want. <laughs> Let's go ahead, get into our college football playoff picks before we um, get to the spread picks after that. But college football playoff, and we'll start, Daniel, with you. Right now, who is in your top four? Well, I, I think even if Trevor, if Clemson loses next two games without Trevor Lawrence, I think the the playoff committee gives uh, Clemson uh, give, give gives ten, Clemson a spot. So it's Clemson, Alabama, and Ohio State. This graphic is wrong. I don't have Oklahoma State number four. I got I got Michigan at number four, uh, and and this is to my this is to to my hero and, and the guy who was so nice to me on air, Rich Eisen. I I look Mi- Michigan's is one of the one of the toughest schedule in the country. And even if they have one loss, as, as, as long as they don't lose to Ohio State, which I, I understand is a big ask, I think they got I, I, you know, uh, you know, I, I think they got a shot in the playoffs. And again, Rich Eisen, I know you're watching. I, I, I know exactly. I, you definitely are watching our show. Um, but yeah, I got your back, man. I, I, I do. Michigan, uh, go, go Wolverines. <laughs> go Blue. John, who's in your college football playoff right now? So I think even before we got this news about Trevor Lawrence, I uh, have picked Notre Dame to beat Clemson. And so I think, you know, if with Clemson having that loss to Notre Dame, Alabama will continue its dominance in the SEC, bump up to number one. Then we'll have Notre Dame jumping Clemson uh, to go to the second spot, then Clemson. And then I think at some point along the way, uh, Ohio State and or Michigan will lose, get them out of the top four. 
give me Oklahoma State, Big 12 dominance in the top four. Well, you know, my opinion is that Notre Dame is overrated. And that opinion is mostly because every year they're overrated. But you look at a five-point win against Louisville, a Louisville team that struggled. They only beat Duke by 13 points. I don't I, – even with – even without, I should say, Trevor Lawrence playing against um, against Notre Dame next week, I think Clemson still wins. I have them number one, top to bottom. Clemson's just a solid team. Number two, I have Alabama. Again, not much to say other than a really good football team. Ohio State, the same thing. They look good against Nebraska. Number four, again, my number four spot. I like to keep it wild there in that in that Ooh. four spot. And I was looking at the team. Hot, hot take. Cincinnati is a team that. If the chaos continues in the top 10, they are a team that could sneak in. You look at, at, the, uh, at the American Athletic Conference, a lot of good teams in there. They had a big win against SMU last week. They play Memphis this week. They still have UCF on their schedule. So a lot of potential for some quality wins. There's, I think there's a potential for them to get in. They do need some help. Winning out won't just do it. They need chaos to happen. But you know what? The first half of the season has been chaos. I don't see why the second half won't be chaos. Imagine if you're a USCF fan and then you see Cincinnati going into the playoffs this year. And and, and chaos, there were chaos back in 2017. And even then, the national champions did not get a chance at the playoffs. So, Yeah. I mean, all all UCF needed was COVID, but unfortunately, (laughs) you know, hasn't, hasn't worked out for them. Coming up next, best part of the show. We know this is, this is why you're still watching. We have our spread picks for football and for all the CPBL fans out there, we're going to be picking the Taiwan series. So stick around. You don't want to miss it. last time tonight thank you again for joining us and watching the one and oh sports show again i'm thomas fitz joined alongside john kelly and daniel she and it is time for our spread predictions for the weekend although our first game that we're going to start with we're going to pick the whole series for the uni lions and the ctbc brothers john we'll start with you who do you have winning the taiwan series i think the brothers are going to finally get uh, the victory that they've been craving for so long. Uh, if I recall correctly, they've been to the Taiwan series the past four to the five years uh, and have lost all those times. So now is the time for the brothers to lift that trophy. I'm going to agree with you, Daniel. I said I would give you my opinion. I would, I'm going to make my own opinion here, okay? But, I, you know, in a way, it kind of feels like the dodgers Ray series, right, where – where you have uh, the brothers, right? The brothers are the ones who've been there in a while. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, brothers yeah. who have been there the lot, you know, they've been so close, but haven't been able to do that just like the Dodgers were. And then you have the Uni Lions coming in as the underdog. So I think, I think this is the year that the brothers take it. But you know, the Dodgers really, they got lucky that the other team pulled the Cy Young winner out of the, out of the game in the elimination, elimination game. I, okay, I'm going to go with the Lions in seven. I, I think in a one-game playoff, the Lions hold the edge, and if the Lions can push it to game seven, they're not going to take their, their ace out. If, they're, if their ace is stealing, they're not taking him out in the sixth inning, and I have full faith in what will turn out to be if, if in game seven it will be a pitching duel between all the foreign pitchers on both teams. So I'm picking the Uni Lions in game in seven. All right, let's move to the college football world. First game up, Texas A&M hosting Arkansas. Texas A&M, 12.5-point favorites. Daniel, who you got taking this one? I, I, mean, I mean, again, this is one of those games that you just go, who is the team that Arkansas is playing? I don't, rec- I don't recognize the school, uh, even though Arkansas is the underdog. Um, I, I they they look different this year, and I got I got faith in our old um, SWC uh, folks um, down there. In I actually don't know where Arkansas is. I'm just gonna go with Arkansas. <laughs> well, you're on the right track. I think that's a really good pick. I think I don't know if Arkansas wins this outright, 
But Arkansas, like you mentioned, they've looked better than they have in the past. They've, they've had a couple close games with some good teams. So I think this is a game that if Arkansas doesn't win outright, they at least make A&M sweat it out to the end. John? I'm going to take A&M on this one. They've just been too good this season, obviously. Uh, they had that loss to Alabama, I think. Uh, but at least one team in Texas has to be good this year, and it's looking like Texas A&M is the one. Uh, SMU. Come on. Let's be realistic here. <laughs> Give me Can you change the show we trust? Daniel, I said in Shambu shall we trust? In Shambu shall we trust? Hey, he's he's looking good there, up in Dallas. All right, next game, and this game is a game which I can almost assure you the line will change from what we're picking right now. Number one, Clemson, thirty-one point favorite, hosting Boston College. But again, line will probably change, which is favorable for us because you know we got to do that ahead of ahead of Trevor Lawrence being out for the game. Daniel, who do you have? I got this pick in before Trevor Lawrence was diagnosed with with COVID nineteen. I, I got Boston College. I, I think I don't know. It, I I just I think somehow I thought the starting quarterback might not might not make it. I I just got the boss. I I I've been to Boston College. I visited the campus. I think that that must help the team today uh, this weekend. Uh, and I just checked actually. I just just checked the spread about thirty minutes ago. The line hasn't changed yet. So, um, yeah, I'm going back. I'm going with BC. I'm going to agree with you again, Daniel. You know, and, and I also thought before, you know, before the Trevor Lawrence, I thought 31 points was maybe a little much. Boston College, 4-2 and two in the season. A sneaky good team. And, and again, I, even without Trevor Lawrence, Clemson's going to win this game fairly easily. But I think 31 points, just too much to pick against. You know, I'm not a Tom Clancy fan, but I have – I am a Tom Clancy fan, but I don't have any allegiance to Boston College. I think even without Trevor Lawrence, uh, Clemson will be able to make the spread easy. Uh, I still think they're going to lose to Notre Dame next week. But in this game, they're going to take the cake. Next game up, number seven, Cincinnati, my college football playoff team. Seven-point favorites. They host Memphis. John, who do you have? I have Cincinnati. Uh, again, it's another one of those things where just this team is too good. Uh I think Memphis will keep it close. Uh, might even uh, make it a bit of an arrow game for Cincinnati, but Cincinnati will come on top. Yeah, I agree with you, but I do think – I think it's the first half. Memphis might even have the lead. I think Cincinnati might come out a little slow. It's always tough, you know, up to number seven. That's just a lot to kind of get over. That's you know, it's a big ranking. And so then you come into a game like Memphis that is a big game for Cincinnati to prove that they belong – not just in the top 10, but trying to make a college football playoff fit. So I think they come out slow, but I think at the end they win, and they win by more than seven. I, I'm rooting for Tom Thomas's uh, top four picks at the end uh, this week. So go Cincinnati. I love what – you're. You, it was an idea. I don't think they executed it, but I love the black field. And I think just on that and Thomas's top four picks, Cincinnati gets, uh, gets my pick. Yeah, because my number four spot is always a lock. <laughs> <laughs> all right next game number 24 Oak, oklahoma they're traveling to lubbock but oklahoma 14 point favorites daniel who do you have you, you i don't think uh, tech having uh, a poor defense i don't think they can outscore the oklahoma sooners i think they're gonna sooners are kind of back on the right track a little bit i hate to say i hate to say this but i'm going with the crimson and cream yeah, I agree with you, Daniel. We're we're on the same page today so far. It feels weird. <laughs> Doesn't happen much. Yeah, but again, I agree. I mean, I mean, I think Oklahoma, like you said, they're they're riding the momentum. They're starting to kind of get into the rhythm that they weren't able to be with. Again, with Spencer Spencer, not Spencer Sandler, Spencer Rattler, I should say. You know, his first year as the starting quarterback. So I think they're starting to get a feel for the offense. And Tech just has a lot of struggles. So I think I think Oklahoma wins this big. John? I'm going to take Tech. This Oklahoma team isn't good. And I'm going to rant for a second here. The fact that they're ranked 24 is terrible. They had a, an equal game as Texas uh, last week uh, against TCU, uh, you know, and how they fared. But somehow Texas gets only two votes uh, in the AP poll. Not even ranked, but Oklahoma makes it back to 24 after not being ranked. That's ridiculous. Give me tech. 
Oklahoma can go out of America. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take them. I, I represent the island of Taiwan. We will take the Oklahoma Sooners. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm a Texas fan, but I take it. But, but but I would I would take a playoff team. Just saying. All right, let's stay in the Big Twelve for our next game. West Virginia, three and a half point favorites, hosting number sixteen Kansas State. John, who are you going with here? I'm going with Kansas State, and I think they're going to score much higher. This is three and a half. That's ridiculous. It's going to be a blowout by Kansas State. I mean, I'm agreeing with all of y'all this show. Yeah, I mean, three and a half points, I get it. It's on the road. But Morgantown at whatever capacity they're doing in West Virginia, I don't care. West Virginia, signif- I would, maybe not significantly, but definitely overrated this season. They beat Kansas. They beat Baylor. And they took them two overtimes to beat a not good Baylor team. Kansas State, they're kind of finding their legs. I think they win this big. You know what? For you guys out there, I really, you know, you know what? I'm just going to say, look, West Virginia is a long flight. Kansas State, you know, they, they had to fly a while to all the way to West Virginia. You know, it's always not the best environment to play and just consider how far it is from the rest of the Big 12. Based on that and the fact that you guys, both of you guys chose Kansas State, I'm going to go with the Mountaineers. The ghost of Will Greer is still in that stadium, and he's going to somehow propel West Virginia over the Wildcats. <laughs> All right, next game, a rivalry that might not be super close. Number 13, Michigan, 24 and a half point favorites. They host Michigan State. Daniel, does your college football playoff team take it? Yeah, you know what? Again, Rich Eisen, I know you're watching. I got your back. Go blue. Go blue. I look, if you you lost the Ruggers, okay, Michigan State. I'm sorry. You're just not you, you're just not the big boys on the block. I'm sorry. You lost the Ruggers. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to disagree with you, Daniel, but losing the <laughs> Rutgers is bad. However, however, we got to have a, a not so fast. Let me grab my pencil. Not so fast. I don't know what the weather is up there, but I'm assuming it's if it's cold down here, it's definitely cold up there. I think Michigan wins this easy, but I think it's going to be a low scoring game because it's probably cold and maybe snowy. So not so fast right there. John, who you got? Look, everything in my body is telling me to go to Michigan. My dad attended UM. My rest of my family, a lot of them went to Michigan. Uh, their coach is the brother of my favorite NFL team's head coach. But I'm a superstitious man. And five years ago, Michigan State upset Michigan in that incredible game and that last second uh, play. Give me Michigan State. Wow. Wow. Bold pick. All right, sticking in the Big Ten. Number three, Ohio State, 21-point favorites. They're hosting Penn State fresh off Penn State's loss um, against Indiana last week. John, who are you going with? I'm going with the Nittany, Nittany Lions. I think the Big 12 will be thrown in chaos. Big, 12, Big Ten, uh, rather. <laughs> uh, obviously, I, I mentioned that Ohio State's not in my top four. And I think this will be the game that ruins it for them. Yeah, that certainly would cause chaos for the Big Ten and, and would be fitting for the way this college football season has gone. But I'm going to have to hit you with a not so fast Penn State. I mean, look, Indiana, it was a huge win for them. They're looking better. I don't care. Penn State shouldn't have lost that game. Ohio State's on a roll. They're coming in. They're blowing out Penn State. James Franklin's going to be on the hot seat after this game. I, I I agree with Thomas, uh, and it just feels well uh, to, to agree with Thomas. Um, uh, you know, yeah, again, uh, it's uh, when Michigan when Michigan beats Ohio State later in the game, it's only gonna make it sweeter that Ohio State is, it, it has a has an undefeated record going into the game. So I'm I'm gonna roll with Ohio State um, until the game the, the the game at the end of the season. All right, speaking of the game, our game this week, Oklahoma State hosting Texas. Oklahoma State, a six-point favorite in Stillwater. Daniel, who you got? So it doesn't matter who I pick. And I I think (laughs) I've been on the show twice, uh, one as a host and one as an analyst. It doesn't matter who I pick for the Texas game, Texas loses. I picked Oklahoma (laughs) during the Red River rivalry game, and I think I picked uh, picked Texas to, to win the TCU game. 
So it doesn't matter who I pick, Texas will end up losing the game. That being said, <laughs> if Texas end up losing the game, I would rather be right than wrong. So I'm going with the Cowboys uh, down there, up, up there in Stillwater. I'm picking OK State. Not so fast, Daniel. I don't know if Texas is going to win this game, but I do know that this team's definitely going to come out with some fire. They're coming off the bye week, giving them some time to get healthy. And Texas has a knack for close games. Whether Texas wins or loses, I think it's going to be closer than six points. John? I know it's going to seem like I have a bias for schools that end in state. But I'm <laughs> going to take, for the third time tonight, Oklahoma or a school that ends in state. Oklahoma State, as I said, I think they're going to be in the top four. And one stepping stone on that journey is to beat Texas. Horns down. Oklahoma State. Oh my gosh! I wait. I, I'm muting you right now. Not that it really, <laughs> not that it really matters. But John is muted. You don't say horns down on my show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our last game, Sunday Night Football, electric matchup. You have the <laughs> five and one or whatever it is, Eagles against the two and five or whatever they are, Cowboys. John, we'll start with you. I'll unmute you for this. Who do you have in this game? <laughs> First off, I want to say the absolute disrespect by uh, whoever schedules the games. Like, I know they can change them around. Why not have Ravens Steelers uh, a battle for it's looking like second place in the AFC prime time? But instead, we have this disgusting matchup. And because it's so disgusting, the football gods are going to be looking down on this game, disappointing, crying. And because we have such a disappointing matchup, we're going to have a disappointing outcome. It's going to be a tie. Wow. Oh if that God. comes true, that comes true. You don't even pick the line. You say it's going to be a tie. Like That's like triple points right there. A lot of props. <laughs> a lot of props to you if that happens. For me, I'm going to have to go with the Eagles. I mean, we saw a little bit of Danucci last week. I don't care if he's a great quarterback. There's just nothing going right on the Dallas team. If Dak would win, there's no way that a rookie third string from James Madison is going to win. I don't even care if they're playing the Eagles. Give me the Eagles. Yeah, the only thing that went well for me this, so far this season in, in sports is going 8-2 and two, my last time being on the show. All my picks – uh, flex, a flex there, and and that goes with, and that includes the Cowboys. They're they're, they're my, uh, I'm a mild Cowboys fan. I'm not a huge NFL guy, but when all of my team loses, I look for Cowboy, to look to the Cowboys for some comfort. They have not delivered that at all this season, so I'm not gonna. I don't have any hope for them at all this, uh, and, uh, and with with uh, Randy Dalton and Dak Prescott being out, so I'm going with the Eagles. I, I mean. I, again, like you said, Thomas, I, I just, you just can't go with the third string quarterback. Yeah. Well, Daniel, I think that was maybe two picks we agreed on there. You know, we're we're sinking up here. This is good. This is a breakthrough. That's what I. Call I don't think. I think I'm going two and eight this this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll uh. certainly see. Well, that's all we have for you this week. Again, thanks so much for tuning in on your Friday morning. And make sure to tune in to our sister shows, College Press Box airing on Tuesday nights at 6.30, College Crossfire Wednesday nights at 9.30. For all of us in studio and mass control, I'm joined alongside John Kelly, Daniel Shi. I'm Thomas Fitch. Have a good Friday morning.